and of, uh, of the universe. Constituents that cannot be cut into smaller pieces and therefore they are called elementary particles. CERN is based uh, in Switzerland, in Geneva, close to the border with France. And here you can see uh, an aerial view of the, of the region with, the, uh, with the, the lake here, and uh, Switzerland on the bottom part of the screen and, and France on the, on the top part. And the ring, the circle you see, uh, indicates the location of the Large Hadron Collider. It's the most powerful accelerator uh, humanity ever, has ever built. Uh, it's a 27 kilometer ring, 100 meter underground, where we accelerate two beams of protons in the two opposite direction of the, of the ring, and then we bring them uh, into collisions at four point. But what is an elementary particle and what is its size? So let's start from something that we know, a human hair. Okay, this is a human hair. So the size is 100 microns, so one tenth of a millimeter. A micron is one millionth of a meter. And then if you go down deeper into the structure of matters, we find cells, of course. And then going deeper and deeper, we find various structures, fibrils and proteins, for instance. Here we go, keratin. And then if we go down and deeper, we found atoms. In the case of air, we have nitrogen, sulfur, oxygen, and carbon. Now, atoms are not elementary particles. They are made of substructure. They are made of a central nucleus surrounded by a cloud of electrons. Electrons are elementary particles, whereas the nucleus is not. It's made of substructures. And these substructures are called neutrons and protons. They have a size of one Fermi. A Fermi is 10 to the minus 15 meter. Neutrons and protons are not elementary particles. They are made of substructures, and these substructures are called the quarks. The quarks are elementary particles as far as we know today. So electrons and quarks are the fundamental constituent of matter. They are elementary particles, and uh, the matter, all the matter we are uh, we are made of, all us human beings, is made of uh, electrons and quarks. When I say all human beings, I mean everyone. So even the VIP here in Davos, <laughs> even the head of state, everyone is made of electrons and quarks. So uh, science and certain exploration with the Large Hadron Collider allows us to study matters at the level of its fundamental constituent, the quarks. So on physical scales of 10 to the minus 18 meters or smaller, so a billions of a billions of a meter. So in some sense, uh, accelerators can be compared to big microscopes. The smaller the structure you want to study, the more the energy you need, because you need a very high resolution power. So if uh, to study you know, human cells, uh, you can uh, uh, just use a microscope in the lab. If you want really to study matter at the most fundamental level, you need to uh, use big accelerator with a lot of uh, energy, and we will see how this uh, is, is done. At the same time, this study of the very, very, very small allows us to study the very, very, very big, so the structure and evolution of the universe. Today we know with high precision that the universe has been uh, at the origin from a big explosion some 13.8 uh, billion years ago. At the beginning, it was very hot and very dense, and it was essentially a gas of elementary particles. Then it expanded and cooled down, and then the elementary particles started to get together. First, the quarks to form neut uh, neutrons and protons, then neutrons and protons to form nuclei, nuclei with electrons to form atoms, atoms to form molecules, and then the, up to the macrostructure that we see here, um, stars, planets, um, um, galaxies, and of course, us, the human beings, and our hair, so we are, this is the uh, reverse movie of what I showed before. So the Large Hadron Collider allows allow us to probe the universe at times corresponding to 10 to the minus 12 seconds after the Big Bang, one millionth of a millionth of a second. So what does this mean? It means that the energy that we produce in the collisions of the two proton beams corresponds to the temperature that the universe had at this time. And the temperature was 100,000 billion times the temperature in this room. 
So we are able, so these numbers are quite impressive, we are able to reproduce in the lab, uh, in controlled condition, we are able to reproduce the phenomena that characterize the very primordial, the very early universe. So uh, the elementary particles that were there, the interactions, uh, the various phenomena that, that took place. To do that, we need three uh, big classes of instruments. We need particle accelerators, we need particle detectors, and we need powerful computing computers. So let's start from, from the accelerators, and here we are back again to, quick again, yes, to the ring. So as I said at the beginning, we inject two protons in the two, um, two proton beams in the two opposite directions, and we accelerate them at the largest possible energies. The limit only comes from the technology. The technology is superconducting magnets that are needed to provide a very strong field to keep the, the beams on the circular trajectory. <clears throat> and these two beams collide in four experiments. So these are four giant uh, uh, instruments, uh, uh, underground instruments. When I say giant, I mean, uh, a cathedral, take you know half Notre Dame and put it underground. Okay, and the goal and the purpose of these experiments is to detect the product of the collisions. So you have these high energy beams colliding. The movie should go on. Yes, colliding in these big underground instruments, and they produce thousands of particles. And the and the, and the task of the detector is to measure each single, every single particle producing the collision, identify those particles, measure their energy, uh, reconstruct their tra trajectories, and give us a, a, a picture, an image of the collision event. So if accelerators can be compared to giant microscope, particle detectors can be compared to digital cameras that take pictures of the collisions. But you know, uh, it's very special in high-tech cameras because the two particle beams uh, collide 40 million times a second. So this detector must be fast enough to look and to take picture of this, of the, of the events and then discard those that are not uh, useful or interesting and then uh, um, save to storage only those that can be, uh, that are, uh, deserve further study. So from this you can, for instance, deduce if you have produced a X boson, a W, a Z particle, and then study uh, you know, the constituent of metals with very high precision. All this will not be possible without the contribution of scientists from all over the world. So uh, CERN attracts some 16,000 people, uh, uh, technicians, scientists, engineers, physicists from all over the world. More than 110 nationalities are represented. We also have scientists coming from underprivileged countries, so in this, in this case our mission is capacity building, and some of the scientists actually come from countries that are not the best friends of each other, actually countries that are in conflict, and they work together at CERN, animated by the same passion for, for, for knowledge. Computing is also extremely impressive because we have a distributed population across the world, so we need distributed computing. So at the time of the conception of the LHC, CERN and its, and, and its partner developed what is called the LHC computing grid. So a, a grid of more than 150 uh, computing centers uh, uh, distributed across the world and connected by very fast uh, links and, and networks, uh, providing a storage capacity of two exabytes and something like one million processing uh, cores. Now, this instrument, Detectors, accelerators, and computers are um, extremely sophisticated. For instance, in the case of computing, the, the, the LHC computing grid uh, has paved the way to the cloud. So really um, um, instruments that uh, develop and, and, and that are based on very uh, cutting-edge technologies that in some cases are really pioneering uh, technologies. Th these technologies are transferred to society to the benefit of everyday life. And they are transfer free of charge because the, the funding conversion convention of CERN, which was signed by the member states back in 1954, states that everything we do, the results of our research, the technologies we, we develop are available to everybody free of charge. This is what we call today open science, but already there, 70 years ago, that was already present in the founding convention of CERN. So I will give you some example. Everybody knows that the World Wide Web was invented at CERN by Tim Berners-Lee. At the time, he was uh, working as a CERN employee. 
But other examples are, for instance, accelerators that are used to treat cancer using proton, ion, and electron beams, which for some tumors are more effective than the conventional radiotherapy, and also in particular because they do not, do not have side effects, they do not uh, you know, create problems to the healthy uh, uh, tissues. Superconducting materials have the, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, possibility of, uh, of wide application. The image was too, uh, was too fast, I cannot go back in the moment, but the previous image showed a, a, a radiation dosimeter aboard the, uh, on board the International Space Station. And here, you can see here, is a, a high resolution 3D color image of a medical image made with CERN electronics. So several uh, decades of exploration at CERN and in other laboratories for particle physics across the world allowed us to discover several elementary particles they are shown here and understand their properties in detail and their interactions. The last one to be found is the Higgs boson, which was discovered at CERN 10 years ago, as Magdalena correctly said, a very special particle uh, without which atoms, of which we are all made, will not, be, will not exist as stable systems, so we will simply not be uh, here. However, these particles and this interaction only explain the so-called visible universe, which is 5% of what is out there. The rest, 95%, is made of formal matter that we don't know, and we call them actually dark matter and dark energy. Dark indicates, on one hand, our ignorance, and on the other hand, the fact that they do not, they do not interact with our instruments, so we don't see them. And I would like to, to, to conclude with a beautiful image of the sky. While what really strikes us in this image is, of course, are the stars, the galaxies, the bright objects, Actually, the most fascinating, the most intriguing uh, part is the dark. The dark is today mysterious. We don't understand the dark uh, universe, and that's a focus of uh, scientific exploration today and tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was, uh, that was terrific. And, um, a couple of reflections, if I may, and then I, I start off with a question. I hope you have began to formulate questions uh, of your own. Really striking couple of reflections as you, were, as you were speaking. The first one is that fundamental unity of us all. And of course, it's not just the VPs and the politicians at, at, at Davos. It's all matter around us. So that fundamental uniting um, uh, um, basis to, to not just life, but everything that exists uh, on this planet and, of course, in the universe. And the second thing, just now what you said here about you know, the, the fundamental discoveries, the fundamental research such as this, teach us how to look at problems and, and what it is that may be interesting, exactly as Fabiola said, at first glance, it seems all the shiny things are really interesting. Yes. And of course, they are interesting. But more important is... Exactly. More important is what, what's in between, in part, because that's the most mysterious, mysterious aspect. And so let me start with the first question, and, and please get yourselves ready. So I rather suspect that the image you're showing here is from the James Webb telescope, right? Yes. We've, of course, seen so many images already over the last um, uh, few months, last month of the year. You illustrated very beautifully how recreating these very early moments in, in the history of the universe uh, sheds light on that history. How does it compare the information that we're getting from a really powerful telescope like James Webb and the information that we get from experiments? It's, um... So, thanks for a very good question. So, um, I showed a very um, complex image showing a, a picture of the evolution of the universe and the, showing on the two ends the telescopes and the accelerator. So, the, the, the two types of, of instruments are complementary. Telescopes try to look at the structure and evolution of the universe by looking at the macro objects, star, galaxies, etc. And by looking at the farthest object, they allow us to go back in, in time. Accelerators are, go, are able to go back to primordial, uh, more primordial epochs at times where light was trapped by the very dense uh, early universe and could not escape, so could never come to us. And so 
uh, that that's, so accelerator can go uh, farther back in time, and, and of course the, the information that comes from both can be is combined, can be and is combined, and can give us a, a more complete understanding. Of course, as I said. Uh, there is still a lot to be um, understood, dark universe, dark matter, dark energy, there are different interpretations, for instance, for the nature of dark matter, and, uh, and so by combining also the information from telescope and acce particle accelerator and other experimental endeavor, like big detector underground that look, for instance, at dark matter coming from the uh, uh, intergalactic halo uh, and interacting with the detector itself, we can try to get the full picture and the, and the right picture. Thank you. Any questions from the audience or comments? Please go ahead. There's a microphone coming to you. Hello. Uh, I believe the, uh, 10 years ago, after you discovered the first Higgs boson particle, what is the next uh, aim or goal of CERN? Thanks. Thanks very much. Well, it's, it's to, you know, the, the goal of CERN is to address, as the goal of all scientific endeavors, is to address the outstanding question. So uh, the discovery of the Higgs boson allow at, allowed us to answer one of those questions, the origin of the masses of the elementary particles, which is absolutely essential to understand why atoms are stable systems and why we are, we are here. Uh, the Higgs boson itself, it's a very special and very peculiar particle. It's part of this standard model of particle physics. I showed one slide without going into the details, but if you look at the details of the theory, all the problems in the standard model, which describes very well uh, the elementary particles and uh, their interaction, originates in terms related to the, to the Higgs boson. We don't understand its mass, we don't understand fully the way it couples, we don't understand uh, um, the, um, the vacuum that is related also to the Higgs boson. So there are many, many questions that are related to it. Beside the Higgs boson itself, of course, what I said, dark matter, for instance, uh, if dark matter happens to be, happen to be made of particles that have uh, you know, masses at the level of from a few hundred GV to a few TV, it can be produced in proton-proton collision at CERN. If it's made of something like, like uh, something different, like uh, primordial uh, black holes, that, then other instruments are more suitable to, are, or are, are suitable to detect it. So we will continue to address these this open questions, and I can't tell you which one will be answered first. This is an <laughs> in the ends of nature, but of course it's very fasc fascinating that we have those interesting questions, but also that we have learned with time what are the right questions to ask. You are next, I think. If you just wait a second for the microphone. Thank you. Doctor, I, it's, uh, it's so fascinating, and. Uh, it seems to me that there is such a big advance, advancement and but there is a disconnection sometimes between all this advancement and what kids are learning in school. And um, they, they still are being taught the very basics of uh, the atoms and the electrons and the protons and not, not so much of what really is happening, what the scientists like you have discovered. So the question is, how could we help uh, the scientists to actually uh, take all these learnings and teachings to the younger kids and the younger generation that will come after you and, and hopefully advance beyond what you have achieved? Thank you. It's a very good question. Uh, it's true. And uh, now if you look at the textbooks at school, in some cases you find the standard model and maybe in some cases you find the X boson, but in most of them you don't. You find mainly classical mechanics, very little uh, quantum mechanics, uh, not, not even in very simple, in the simplest term. I think it's very important that we scientists continue to um, communicate and to educate uh, the younger uh, generation. I, I, I would like to mention maybe a, um, a project that we are realizing at CERN, it's called the Science Gateway. We are building a new building complex where we will have, of course, uh, exhibition and many interactive activities for the general public, but we will also have labs for kids starting at age of five, all the way up to 16 until they go to a um, university or so, where the kids can come and do experiments with their own, own hands and understand what being a scientist means. And this means having a question and a problem to solve, building the instruments, making the measures, and, sh and, and share the results with their peers. So the other kids at school, in their case, with other scientists in our case. So I think if you all scientists in all our labs or um, research infrastructure try really to attract uh, attract the public. We also have at CERN, like in many other laboratories, 
programs for the high school teachers that come and spend some time with us. This is also an important message because they get an update on modern physics and they can then make pressure so that, you know, the textbooks and, uh, and their teaching at school is up to date. There was a question in the middle and then at the front. Um, thank you for the presentation. Um, do you use artificial intelligence in a meaningful way in your research, or if not, are you planning to, to do We that? do. We do. And actually, CERN is really very much on the front line for developing on, of uh, uh, machine learning and AI techniques, of course, because the problems that we have to solve are extremely complex. When you look at this, you know, these collisions of uh, proton beams, you produce thousands of particles. And so sometimes the signal that come in the presence of uh, particles that have uh, that are produced very rarely like the x boson the x boson is not produced so often you know you need to extract very tiny signal from a large number of data so very complex analysis techniques and very complex algorithm and there is exactly where ai can help so really we are really using this and because and because our requirements are extremely stringent this is also cern is also very often a test bed for companies developing ai or uh, or developing technologies on, uh, on quantum now that can be used for um, you know more advanced algorithms and uh, so yes was there a question here in the front row can we go to the front first please J just here on the all right Michael Jan from, from Denmark. Uh, first of all, I, it's fascinating what you're telling, and, and I'm still trying, I'm still struggling by understanding that the most important is the darkness here. Exactly. So, my question is when we come back in 10 years' time, do you expect that we will see more dots on, on this photo? And then another question on the more political thing is you, you talked about open science, which is also fascinating, but how is that affected by the global uh, geopolitics? geopolitical uh, war between uh, China and, and USA, for example, is this threatened this open science? So starting with the first question, which is easier. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I can't tell you if in 10 years from now we will, we can, you know, put a name on the particles or the forces or whatever that, uh, uh, that can explain the dark universe. This I can't tell you. I hope so. Uh, at least for part of it, dark matter, which is maybe a little bit uh, easier, uh, in quotes, to solve. It depends on really what, what nature has, has, has put out there. Of course, there, but, but I, I can tell you that dark matter and dark energy are the, 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 the objective of an extremely broad class of scientific endeavors, not only accelerator physics, physics, but also telescope and other studies. Now, we, of course, gravitational waves uh, detection and, and study comes in, so what we call uh, multi-messenger astronomy. So we are doing huge progress in the, in the technologies and in our way of exploring the universe with very complementary instruments. So I think that we we, we can get nice results, I hope, soon, but I can't tell, can't tell, tell you when. Concerning, uh, concerning open science, uh, for the time being, you know, the game of the rule at CERN is that what we do is open science, and we have collaborators from the US, we have collaborators from China, and this has never been questioned. It's a, it's a value of CERN, it's a mission of CERN. If I may follow up on this, I think you, you started, you opened up with the second part of your question, a really, really interesting issue here about open science, but also collaboration more broadly. So this, this openness, information exchange, I always think you know, much of this research and indeed what you talked about in, in the context of CERN happens in an academic context. But of course, there's research that happens in the private sector and, and relevant to this, but also other disciplines. And there is a... I think an opportunity, a real opportunity, to consider um, how in an open collaborative way right. there may be exchange of, of data and, and information um, in this sort of pre-competitive space, yeah. if you like. So, uh, right, good point, Magdalena. So first of all, um, it's true that it's much easier to be open in an academic world. In, in our case, for instance, we do not develop many technologies that have a potential dual use so you know, it's um, so security issues are not so um, important and also uh, also limiting or constraining in our case. 
So it's much easier in the, in the purely academic world than in, uh, in the private sector or at the level of um, government or activities that have a link, direct link with government security, etc. However, it's also true that there are other um, fields where global sharing of data is not a, 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 a practice, it's not uh, you know, in some medical fields, for instance, this came up at the time of vaccine, for instance. So I think it's important that we try to, to push for, for open science, for, for, for uh, data sharing and information of, uh, and information of uh, sharing of information, because open science is as many virtues. First, it boosts science itself, because the more you change with other scientists, the faster science goes. Second, it maximizes the impact of science on society. And third, also, is a very powerful uh, means of reducing the inequities across the world. Because, of course, if uh, everybody has access to science, education and technology, of course, for free, free of charge, then, of course, uh, you reduce the, the, the gap, which today, unfortunately, is widening with the, with the technology having such a, 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 a disruptive evolution, disrupting in a positive sense, and being uh, extremely, you know, the, growing uh, very fast, the gap widens. Exactly. And the impact on society, you can also extend it into thinking um, in terms of trust in science, right? And, and that, of course, is something that Absolutely. we, the science community, research community, is very concerned with. You mentioned vaccines, we saw that. Exactly, uh, which can, of course, uh, can help to fix the, this real or perceived mistrust in, in, in science through, again, open science and sharing technology, technology and showing the impact of science, but also through communication, transparent communication. This uh, what I was mentioning before. Exactly. Other questions? I think there was a question there. There's a question here now. Thank you very much. I'm the Italian ambassador to the United Nations in Geneva, including to CERN, Gian Arezzo Cornado. I wanted to congratulate you for hosting this event and congratulate the Director General, Fabiola Gianotti, for her presentation. She's quite unique because she can explain uh, very complicated issues to people who are not specialists. And I believe there are very few people like Professor Gianotti capable to do that. I have a lot of admiration for her. I have a question on, uh, on the universe. Uh, th thanks to the accelerator, we are capable to study the origin of the, uni of the universe. Uh, you believe it will also be possible to predict the future evolution of the universe and to understand whether the universe, after having had an origin, will also have an end? Thank you. <laughs> so what we know, I can answer, I can answer um, by maybe elaborating a little bit on this concept of dark energy. Actually, we have here in the room Brian Schmidt, a Nobel laureate, who is uh, the, the person who has uh, understood within the group of Berkeley uh, also uh, that the universe is expanding today at an accelerated pace. So you can imagine the initial explosion of the universe, the Big Bang, and then the, explosion, the, the universe expand and then, um, and then cools down. I can imagine that at some point, because of the gravity, so the various masses formed, because of the gravity, then the various masses tend to implode and the universe at some point will implode and uh, we go back to, uh, say, the uh, uh, very initial state. But we have discovered, as I think about five billion years ago or so, uh, the universe started to expand again at an accelerated pace. And we didn't, this we don't understand. We think that there is a form of energy, a pressure, so it's a scalar energy, scalar force, a pressure that pushes the universe apart, every single point away from each other, and counterbalance the gravitational attraction. So we are accelerating now uh, at, uh, at, an, at, at an accelerate, I mean, I mean, we are in an accelerating expansion um, phase. Um, this is what we can tell today. We have run out of time for any further questions. I'm actually delighted to see how many questions there have been, Fabiola. That's credit to oh, your ability to tell the story in this very, very engaging way. A couple of final comments. Um, I really want to emphasize for you that incredible fascination and um, hunger for understanding of the very fundamental properties of, of matter and the universe around us and how that um, fundamental interest in, in getting to the bottom of everything that is around us and within us unites us all. Yes. And you talked about collaboration among scientists from parts of the world who don't come together 
don't convene, um, are not, don't have a seat at the same table in really any other, um, uh, in any other uh, situation. And that's um, one power of science, which I think we don't talk about it's a glue. enough. Absolutely, it's a glue. Thank you very much. Thank you, Magdalena. Viola, and thank you to all of you.